Would you clap your hands and love the Lord tonight? Hallelujah. 
Jesus, you're all I want. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Amen. Amen. How many want nothing but the Lord tonight? Amen. Amen. So good to see all of you tonight. God bless you. If you'll grab your Bibles. How many have a Bible with them tonight? Amen. Turn to the book of beginnings, Genesis, the third chapter. Genesis, the third chapter. Amen. Amen. Missing a lot tonight. It's like we get to February and people want to go to Miami and Florida and everywhere else. We got lots and lots of people traveling and uh, lots and lots of folks uh, sick, not feeling well tonight. I know Sister Rachel is home. She is not well tonight. So we want to remember her. Brother Fincher is actually uh, in the emergency room right now. So we're going to call out his name in prayer here in just a moment that God would touch him. And, uh, of course, we all know somebody who's sick right now. Amen. We all know somebody who's sick. So we're going to call on these names here in just a moment. Um, also would like the church to, to be in prayer. Wow. For my nephew, Easton. He's 14 months old, and um, of course, this is Pastor Nave. You all know Brother Brad Nave, his son Bradley, uh, his wife. Easton was born last December, and then this December they had Emmy, so they've got two children under the age of 14 months, which is enough in and of itself, right? And um, man, I'm sorry. Brother Nave and, and uh, Bradley were supposed to go to Because of the Times with me. And they had to cancel out that Sunday before because Emmy, the one-month-old, uh, was put into the pediatric intensive care for six days with RSV, which is a big enough trial being in an, in an intensive care in Peoria, not even in there in Bloomington. And then uh, they got out, I think, on Saturday. The following Thursday, they were taken east into a, a pretty routine doctor's appointment uh, to have his eyes looked at and thought uh, maybe you know, glasses or something along those lines and as they begin to look they um, they begin to notice some other things in the eye exam and they took a few other exams and um, they said we believe your son has a condition which is called retinoblastoma which affects one in one million children and what it is, is there are cancerous tumors on the back of his eyeballs. And they saw those in an exam, so they said, we need you to go to Chicago tomorrow. This is be last Friday and see a, a, a specialist for this. And he confirmed the diagnosis of retinoblastoma, which uh, they, didn't, they did MRIs and did a pretty comprehensive exam. So where they're at now is uh, tomorrow morning. They'll be heading down to Memphis, and they're going to start Little Easton on chemotherapy on Thursday of this week, but they'll head down tomorrow to St. Jude's, and um, they'll start that. Thankfully, there's been so many miracles that have been worked out already, and I believe that this is just the beginning of what God's going to do in that young man's life. So I wonder if you'll remember Sister Rachel, Brother Fincher tonight, Little Easton, if you would just lift up all these names and the ones that you know that are sick. None greater than the other. We're going to call on the matchless name of Jesus and have ask him to have his way, Lord Jesus.
get all the glory. You will get all the glory. Amen. Amen. If you'll just continue to remember these needs this week. Amen. And believe and know that God's a healer. Amen. Amen. I can't say how good it is to have Pastor Cawthart back with us. Amen. Amen. <laughs> we have missed him. And uh, we felt his prayers and know that he wanted to be here with us. But we've missed him. And it's so good to have him back here on a Sunday. Of course, we're missing Pastor Brent tonight. It was not his intention to miss uh, like this morning. Um, they've got a, a very uh, busy and an extremely important week this week at Urshan with a, a comprehensive site visit from the accreditation uh, agencies. Um, so his flight uh, was canceled and uh, for the, later this afternoon and he was able to catch I think one of the last flights out this morning so um, he called me this morning he said uh, do you still love me <laughs> are you glad you're here in Aurora I said absolutely and he said this is not planned at all and I knew that but um, he had to head out of town to get there because that's that's an extremely so remember Pastor Brent this week and Urshan College that that the Lord would just uh, help them this week amen amen didn't Angela Caltharp in the Kingdom Kids Department do a fantastic job this week? Amen. What a week we had. Amen. Amen. And it's not over yet. Does anyone have just a little bit of church left in them yet? Amen. Just a little bit. Amen. Amen. That's usually a death sentence when a preacher says, can you handle a little bit of preaching? Which usually means he's going to preach for the next hour and 28 minutes. So, which would be half of the time we waited at Denny's the other night. So I think I'm okay. <laughs> God bless Denny's. Genesis chapter 3. Amen. Just going to read two scriptures here. Verse 6. It's already in front of you. So the woman, let's read it. Woman saw that the tree was good for food, was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Amen. Amen. We know this, this scripture tonight. I'm going to talk about it for just a moment, but I want to talk on this, this title tonight. It's a question. The question is simply this. Who told you? Who told you? Look at your neighbor and say, who told you? <clears throat> who told you? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Lay your Bibles down. Let's ask God to, uh, to speak to us tonight. Let's, let's pray together. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, anoint our ears to hear your word, God, and let it receive it. In Jesus' name, let everyone say amen. 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 You may be seated tonight. Amen. I can't preach with chapped lips. <laughs> amen. 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 I know a preacher, a good friend of mine, he, he does not go to the pulpit without uh, eye drops. I figure if he can do eye drops, I can do, I can do chapstick every now and then. Amen. We, we live in an information age. We know stuff about stuff we probably shouldn't know about, or really anyone's ever cared about, but, but, but we can learn anything we want at any time, and just about anywhere you go, information is literally at your fingertips and think about how far we've we've come uh, it wasn't that long ago that that information came in the form of a piece of paper that was thrown at your front door every morning and you had no idea what happened on the other side of the world until 
the, the newsboy, the paper boy, came and, and dropped off a newspaper at your home. That's not that long ago. I, I worked in the newspaper industry, not as a delivery boy, thankfully. I probably should have been. Uh, but uh, I worked in the newspaper industry and got out of it fast um, and jumped into a, a website company because that's where things were headed. Used to come in the form of paper, and, and, then, and then we got wonderful CD-ROMs in the mail that said, America Online. Remember that? It sounded a little something like this. It sounded a little something like this. You remember that? Right here. Oh, this was golden right there. You had made it through right there. Yes. Yes, thank you. Yes. Yes. Kids, these kids have no idea what that sound is right there. But listen to this. That's a YouTube clip. It has 10.8 million listens. That's all it is. There's no video to it. It's just an MP3 clip. But the greatest thing was, even if you could suffer through all those alien-like sounds that came out of a, a piece of hardware called a modem, and, and America Online would pop up, it wasn't like you could just start clicking around because you, you could click. And, and you could go make a, a, a bologna sandwich and a, and a Diet Coke, and you could come back to your computer, and you were about halfway to, to loading the page that you were trying to get to. It, it's, it, we've come a long way. Then, of course, we landed in the DSL age, and information came faster and, and, and with more speed. And, man, when you got, like, two meg download speed, you thought, wow. How could it possibly get any better than this? Of course, now we're in the age of fiber, and, and we're not talking about meg speeds. We're talking about gig speeds, and, and where you can go and literally you can surf. As, I don't even know if you call it surfing now. Surfing's kind of a, a slow sport at times, but, but now we're just, we're just flying through the Internet and, and looking up information. And, and, of course, now we're not even tied to a desktop computer because the smartphone invasion began to happen. And no longer being tied to a, a desk and a, a, a big monitor. You remember one of those big monitors? I remember one Black Friday, I was suckered in to going and sitting out at Best Buy. In the middle of the night, it was so cold that, that I had gotten a, 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 a coffee. Uh, it, was, it was one of the, like the Frappuccinos in the glass bottle, okay? And, and my brother-in-law went out and sat in front of Best Buy. And, and we bundled up. We got our chairs. And, and we thought we were really cool. And, and, and about an hour or two into it, I went to take a drink of said coffee. And it was frozen. That's how cold it was that night. This is no joke. And I sat there all night until the morning. I think we were like 10th or 11th in line just to get an e-machine. It was like $250, and the box was like eight feet wide, and, and it had a monitor, and it had a tower, and it had two speakers, and it had a mouse that was corded. You know, it wasn't a wireless mouse, and, 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 and you know, but, but we're so far beyond that. We're, we're into uh, uh, handheld devices, and, and, and they say that, that if you have a smartphone, that you've got more technology in your hand than NASA had when they put the first spaceship into space. You have more technology right here than NASA did when they put a, a space shuttle into to orbit. Of course, now technology is getting even, even further advanced because heaven forbid you have to type something out. Now all you have to do is say, Alexa, what time is it? Oh, I love our house right now. Alexa, turn on the bedroom and you know, the lights come on. Alexa, turn on the kitchen and the lights come on. It is so wonderful that I don't have to walk all the way over to the kitchen wall and lift up my arm and then lift the lever. I can just say, Alexa, turn the kitchen light on, which is really kind of great because I had some people that broke into my home yesterday and they were letting my dog out. They looked eerily similar to Brother Graham and, and Nevaeh Graham. And they were in my house. 
So I came on Alexa and I said, sick em, Kimba, sick em. And I, I'm being a little evangelistic here, right? <laughs> but I did drop in an Alexa to kind of uh, spook them out a bit. You know, it's all it is, Alexa and Siri and Google. And, and, and our cars have gotten this way too. You don't even have to parallel park anymore. You just hit a button and let it go, right? It's information. But with all of this information, there, there, uh, the, the gap or the room for ignorance is shrinking. There, there's so little room for ignorance anymore because of all the technology and information that's readily available, that, that room, that margin that you can claim ignorance, well, you can't really claim that anymore because information is readily available at any minute of the day. However, just because it is readily available and it's at our fingertips and just because you read it online or just because Google has an article or just because Wikipedia returned the results does not always mean that that information is true. My <laughs> this is funny. There, there, there's, I was talking, I think, Brother Miller about this the other day. There, there's these uh, satirical websites where they, they write uh, stories that look like they're legit. They're written like they're from a real news company, but they're really just, just satire. They're, they're fun, and they're, they're great writers to, to read through some of this. Uh, Babylon B is a, a good church one. Uh, it's all about kind of church stuff. And, and uh, I know one article, it said that uh, a large like mega church pastor had installed like a, a, a four like loop uh, water slide as his baptismal. Uh, and that's not true. It's just all in fun and just to kind of have fun at. But, but we were, my, my family and I, we were looking at uh, getting a dog and we were looking at like a, a little Yorkie. And uh, uh, my mother-in-law is the queen of, of Google searches. So she went online, and she's like, you know, you guys don't need a Yorkie. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and she was just kind of letting her have her opinion. Well, what she did is went on Google, and she searched uh, Yorkie barking or something like that. And it gave her a, a, uh, a, 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 an article, an online article, and the article was all about a family who bought a little Yorkie Terrier, and uh, they bought it, and the story goes on to say that it barked consistently for four and a half years. Total satire, total fun, but because she read it online, she thought, well, this has to be true. Someone bought a Yorkie, and it barked for four and a half years. It's, it's quite, quite, I'm, I'm finding more humor in it than you are tonight. The point is information's a dime a dozen. And before you go making declarations about this new piece of information you have discovered, you would be wise to at least check the source. To say, okay, where, where is this coming from? Of course, this has been on display even over the last couple of weeks. Two weeks ago, we learned the unfortunate news that a, a star basketball player, Kobe, had, had passed away in a car, or not a car crash, but a helicopter crash. And I remember we were at, at a restaurant, it was after Sunday uh, church, and we were sitting at a restaurant, and, and I think the, the young people, because they're all connected, you know, they were the first ones to break the news on this youth chat. And they said, oh my, uh, you know, Kobe Bryant has, has died. And, and the adults were like, well, let's just check and see. And we got our phones out, and we didn't see anything on this. So we're like, well, whatever. This is just bad information. And, and a few minutes later, uh, uh, we started looking again, and finally we saw TMZ came out with the article, and, and then we looked, well, is anyone else confirming this? What does Fox say? What does NBC say? And, 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 and I even saw someone on, on social media uh, said that they just kept scrolling on their phone because they were hoping that the story was fake news, that it wasn't real. And I got here to church after lunch, and, and I looked on Fox News, and, and there they had even, listen to this, they had live video of, of the, the, the crash scene and everything, yet the, the announcers, the, the reporters on Fox, they were being extremely cautious in how they're reporting, and they said this, and I wrote this down, we are not confirming the reports, we are just repeating it at this time, because they didn't know yet 
And they realized that their integrity was on the line if you report that someone like a mega superstar basketball player has passed away when maybe it wasn't really them. And people just kept waiting, waiting, uh, and seeing if this news was too truly true. And this really dates back to the 1960s. Back in the 60s when news came via homing pigeons and newspapers, stories began to leak uh, Charlie Chaplin has, has passed away. It's a fake story. Frank Sinatra has passed away. In fact, celebrities now all the time find themselves deceased on social media when they've not been deceased. Celine Dion, Refrigerator Perry, John Bon Jovi, Jackie Chan, Betty White, Tom Hanks. These are just some of the recent celebrities that have looked on social media and found out that they passed away overnight. All oh, just to get a, 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 a click. It's clickbait. That's what they call this. To, to get a click. Someone to look at it. Someone to visit their website. Someone to increase their traffic count so that they can boost sales and get more advertisers. It's all really about money when it comes down to it. You can get yourself in trouble if you do not check your sources. Making a bold claim, making a brash decision based on bad information will lead you down the wrong path. Because breaking stories is, is such a big deal. If a reporter breaks the story first, uh, everyone else has to say, story broken by Bob Nightingale or, or this one or that one or this one or that one. And when they break the story, when they're the first one to get it out, they are lauded, they are patted on the back for their great work. And this is, of course, especially big in the sporting arena. If a trade or an injury is going on, if they can break it first on social media, then they get the credit and their street cred or their online cred goes up. But that backfires every now and then. Sources got some bad information. They leaked it. They posted it. And even though they try to take it down later, the damage is already done. And there are countless stories of reporters who have broke news based on bad information. And when it came out to be false, they lost their jobs over it. It is important that you always check your resources. Someone say amen. In an, in an information age... In a world full of change, in a culture where the only thing constant is change, it is the church that stands in the face of all of that that's going on in our world right now. In an ever-changing world, we, the church, are the one thing that should never change. I'm not saying we can't update and, and change some uh, uh, things here and there, but, but our message will never change. Our doctrine will never change. Our experience will never change. When everything else is changing, let it be said that the church never changes. Why? Because we are the church of the living God, and the Bible says that he is the same yesterday, and he is the same today, and he is the same forever. Therefore, if God never changes, the church should never change as well. That's why David said in Psalm 119, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Forever. That there's no end date. There is no expiration. David, let us all know, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. John 1.1 1, 1 says this, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In other words, before the sun, the moon, and the stars were made, the word was. Before mountains and oceans and streams and lakes, the word was already there before animals and bugs and fish and before the fowls of the air before mankind was created from the dust of the ground the word was always there because it is forever settled in heaven before anything was brought into existence there was the eternal there was the inspired there was the infallible there was the perfect and pure 
and powerful word of God. And not only was the word present before everything was made, but the word lets us know that it will remain when everything else has ceased to exist. That's why Matthew 24 said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So when science, philosophy, education, and governments are over, the word will still be there. When nations and kingdoms and empires and tyrants and kings, when they are passed away, guess what? The word will still be there. When theology and biology and physiology and psychology, when socialism and communism and capitalism are all gone away, the word of God will still remain. When gold is gone, when silver and rubies and diamonds, when they cease to exist, after the dollar bill, the yen, the ruble, and the shekel, when they are all gone, there will still be the precious and the living word of God. Because forever, O oh Lord, thy word, it is settled in heaven tonight. Someone clap your hands and thank the Lord for his word tonight. See, when a, <coughs> we live in a day and time that, that, that things just uh, appear that, that nothing is forever. Look back in time. The Roman Empire, it looked like it would never come to an end. But of course, we can stand here today with history on our side and know that the Roman Empire failed. Go back to the 1930s and 1940s. Germany, the nation, was a military force that was seen destined to rule the world. But by 1945, Germany had been defeated and their leader Hitler had taken his own life because nothing on earth is forever. You go back to the 80s, 1980, there was even a movie called The Day After. That movie was an in, a, a, a crucial part of that time because uh, there was this threat between the United States uh, and what was formerly called the USSR. And we were told, I remember teachers telling us uh, that, that there is going to be a nuclear war uh, and it was the greatest threat on earth. But today, uh, we don't have to face the USSR. We don't have this uh, a threat of nuclear war between us uh, and Russia. Instead, we now deal with things like terrorism and the acts of terror and school shootings and church shootings who knows what tomorrow is going to bring but let me tell you I'm so thankful tonight that I serve a God that will never change it doesn't matter how bad this world is going to get because the Bible says it will wax worse and worse but when the world is falling apart and it's headed to hell in a handbasket, I know I still hold the hand of a God who has never changed his word is settled his word is eternal he is faithful. His law endures to this day. Nothing is forever except the word of God, except for what he speaks. Expect for what is written in your Bible tonight. <coughs> Amen. So let's go to Scripture. Genesis, the third chapter. <coughs> Verse 1, the serpent was subtle, more subtle than any beast of the, the field which the Lord God had made, and he said to the woman, the serpent, Yea, hath God said that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The serpent that came to Eve was more cunning than any beast of the field. His effectiveness was found in his cunning and crafty ways. He came to Eve and began to ask her questions about what God had said, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And here begins this dialogue, this story of a conversation between a serpent who was Satan and God's creation, Eve and Adam who was with her. For whatever reason, Eve began to uh, get into this dialogue, into this conversation. I, I don't know if she she thought she could outsmart him. I don't know if she thought that, that she had things under control. But for whatever reason, she got into this conversation with this serpent. Can, can I give you a news flash tonight? 
I don't care how long you've been in church. I don't care how seasoned of a Christian or a saint of God you are. It's been tried and it's been failed time and time again because you cannot outsmart Satan by yourself. Look at your neighbor and say, you're not smarter than Satan. Look what James said. Pastor James pastored mega churches before mega churches were a thing. He says in James 4, 7, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So that lets us know we are not to engage in a conversation with the Satan. But, but what James said, uh, he said resist him, uh, push him away, uh, and he has to flee from you. Uh, so, honey, even though you can't outsmart him, uh, you can overcome him uh, by the blood of the lamb and the word uh, of your testimony. Uh, so don't go talking around to the Satan uh, day by day. You resist him. Uh, and he, listen, he has to flee from you. It's settled in the word of God. If you would resist him, he has to flee from you. So this craftiness of Satan that made him successful against Eve as the serpent came with his craftiness. And apparently before the curse pronounced in Genesis 3, 14 and 15, this, this serpent was, was different than we know today. For this creature didn't start as a snake, but it became one as it slithered its way into the bushes that afternoon, Eve was not surprised to be speaking with a serpent. If she were surprised, if she were kind of wigged out about the moment, I doubt she would have entered right into this conversation. There was no, no, no uh, 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 surprise in her voice. Angelic beings oftentimes appeared in the form of men. It wasn't so strange to Eve that an angelic being might appear to her in the form of a serpent. It's, it's not entirely important, though, in Scripture tonight, in this message tonight, on, on how Satan began to speak. It's more important on what he began to speak to Eve. Has God indeed said that you shall not eat of every tree? And here we see the first attack leveled, listen, not against Eve. Satan's first attack here was not against Eve. The first attack was on the word of God. Hath God said that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Here's what Satan already knew. He knew that if he could get Eve confused about what God had said, or if he could get Eve to begin to doubt what God, I feel the Holy Ghost right now, if he could get her doubting what the Word of God said, he realized that the battle had already won if he could get her confused about what thus saith the Lord. There's so much truth in that right there. When the, when the enemy comes at you uh, and he starts to level attack, not at you, uh, but he starts to attack the word uh, of our Lord, uh, that's when you can say, no, 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 I'm going to follow what Pastor James said. Uh, resist the, no, 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 talk to the hand, devil, uh, because you've not got any room uh, in my life uh, to live, wage war against the word of God. So we see this from the beginning, Satan trying to undermine God's people by not undermining them, but undermining the word of God in their lives. And he can undermine just as effectively by getting us to neglect the words of God and getting us to doubt the words of God. Because verse 2 says, the woman said to the serpent, well, let me just say this. And I think I've already made this point, but let me say it again. We aren't ever to have a conversation with the devil. We aren't ever to have a conversation with the devil. The only time you should ever have a, have a conversation with the devil is not in conversation, but it's in a rebuke to the Satan saying, get 
down under my feet. Oh, I wish somebody had enough Holy Ghost inside of you right now that you could stand to your feet and say, I've been talking to the devil long enough. I'm done with the conversation. I'm just going to start rebuking him. Satan, you have no authority in my life. Get down under my feet tonight. Somebody, somebody rebuke the devil right now. I hasten on, I hasten on. It seems though Eve doesn't know even which tree to eat of. Verse 3, look at verse 3. <coughs> Shalt thou not eat or touch? Again, it's, a, it's not an attack against Eve. It's an attack against the word of God. It's, he was never instructed. Listen. God never instructed Adam, who was supposed to share with Eve, he was never instructed not to touch the fruit. Now, I agree, it's, it's a good thing to set up that standard before, but could it be possible that the serpent... Now, now, Brother Gums has been here, and he used his imagination, so this is my uh, little attempt at imagination. But is it possible that... That, that as, as he begins to, shall you not eat or touch of it? Again, it never been, never been commanded not to touch. But is it possible that the serpent maybe came by and, and bumped some of the fruit against Eve to show her that she had not died? It's like this morning, the, the rat kind of touching the, the, the trap, right? Nothing happened. Oh, oh, it's okay. Touch it a little bit more. Maybe, just, just maybe. It's, it's just imagination here, and I understand that. But, but maybe he just kind of bumped a little bit where it, it brushed Eve's arm, and she realized that she did not die for touching it, although it was never instructed not to touch it. You will not surely die, verse 4 says, but your eyes will be opened, verse 5. And here the groundwork has been set by Satan. He drew her into discussion. He waged war against what God had said. And then it exposed Eve's incom uh, incomplete excuse me, understanding of what God really said. And Satan can only effectively work when he establishes that foothold. And he began to lay this groundwork and then he struck at Eve. That's why Ephesians 4.27 says, Neither give place to the devil. Don't give the devil a, a foothold here. We, we are never called to give place to the devil, but, but, but you know, it's been said you give the devil an inch, he'll become a ruler in your life, right? Neither give place to the devil. Look at verse 5. In the day that you eat of the fruit, your eyes are going to be open. What a powerful statement. Listen to me right now. The statement in verse 5 is so powerful because it's true. What are you talking about, Greg? This is Satan. He's the liar. He's the father of all lies. How can you say that verse 5 is true? Because he says, in the day, Eve, that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. It's a true statement. Satan, possibly the only time in Scripture, speaks a true statement here. Because why? When they ate of the fruit, guess what? Their eyes were opened. But it was not in the way that it was framed to Eve. He framed it on a positive note. Your eyes are going to be open. You'll be like gods. You will be awesome. You will be incredible. So they ate of the fruit, and it was a true statement when they took a bite and they consumed the fruit. Their eyes were opened, but not in the way that it was framed, but their eyes were open to their own sin and even to their own rebellion here. It's like a deaf person who's never been able to hear in their life to have their ears open, but only to hear the sound of screams for the rest of their lives. What about someone who, who's been blind their whole life and they're miraculously changed and they can see, but what they see is only the, the evil of what is around them. 
Satan sprinkled just enough truth to make that verse 5 one of the most powerful statements in Scripture. Because when Eve saw how good the fruit looked and how pleasant it was, and because she desired to be wise, verse 6 says she took of the fruit and she began to eat. The serpent couldn't force feed it down her throat. It was all on Eve's accord and her own power that she did eat. She was the responsible one. There was a way of escape, but Eve chose not to take it and to go with what looked good to the eye. And verse 7 says that the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. It seems that only after Adam ate of the fruit that they finally knew that they were naked. They devised a plan, Adam and Eve did, to hide their new found nakedness they went and they sewed fig leaves together it wasn't ideal in any stretch of the imagination for clothing it was itchy it wasn't strong but it was the best that they could do on their own and fear began to set in in Adam and Eve's heart and they began to hear in the cool of the morning the Lord walking in the garden and of course scripture lets us know that they went and they hid themselves I want to point your attention to verse 10 tonight. This is the, the part where Adam begins to talk to the Lord. He said, I heard your voice in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked. So I went and I hid myself. Verse 11 says this, and the Lord said, Adam, who told you that you were naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee not that thou shouldest not eat of? Adam and Eve, where are are you getting your information from? What source are you gathering your resources? Who told you, Adam, that you were naked? Eve, who told you that you were to be ashamed? Who told you to go and cover yourselves? Who told you that you had to do it on your own? Unless God says otherwise, his words are forever settled in heaven. You can count it 100% when the Lord says it. If anything that he says, it comes from his mouth. You can bank on it tonight. But if there's anything that comes out that's bad information and it's false, if it's coming from the Satan, you can look at him and say, no, I'm going to check my resources. I'm going to check the word of God. And when the devil tells me something, I'm going to look to the word first and I'm going to base my assumption, my decisions, and my future not on what the enemy he says, but I will base it on the words of God tonight. And look at how God handles this bad information. Verse 21 said, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. In order to make things right, an animal had to be sacrificed to cover the sin of Adam and Eve. This is echoed in the New Testament, the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 18 says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, silver and gold from your vain conversations received by tradition from your fathers, but what you are redeemed by is the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. See, according to the word of God, he has redeemed the world unto himself by the shedding of his own blood on Calvary's cross. And it's through that precious blood from a spotless and a, a perfect lamb, he has purchased our deliverance. He has purchased our salvation. He has purchased our healing. He has purchased our redemption. He has purchased our freedom. He has purchased our liberty. So I just have to ask you one question tonight. Who told you? Who told you that it's over? Who told you there is no hope? Who told you there is no future? Who told you that you're too messed up? Who told you you're too scarred? Who told you you're too broken? Who told you there is no remission? Who told you there is no help? 
who told you there is no forgiveness, who told you your family would never be saved, who told you uh, that your spouse will never be saved, who told you that your parents uh, will never walk with the Lord. I have a question for you tonight, uh, and it's simply who told you? Uh, Who told you that you can't make it? Uh, Who told you that you won't last? Uh, Who told you that you don't have what it takes? Uh, Who told you that you're not good enough? Uh, Who told you you're not smart enough? Uh, Who told you you're not what God is looking for? for. I've got a question for this congregation tonight and it's simply who told you? Who told you that you'll never overcome? Who told you that you'll never conquer? Who told you that you will never have the victory that God has promised you? Who told you that you're in the wrong place? Who told you that you're in the wrong timing? Who told you that you're out of the will of God? I've got a question for you tonight and it's simply who told Told you, or maybe I can phrase it another point: uh, Whose report uh, are you going to believe tonight? Uh, are you going to believe the report uh, that says you will never find healing? Uh, who told you uh, that you'll never be delivered? Uh, who told you that you will never be set free? Uh, that you're always going to be bound uh, to addictions uh, and depression uh, and oppression? Uh, who said uh, you can't have peace uh, that passes understanding? Uh, who said you can't? have joy and joy unspeakable and full of glory. Who says that you'll never have freedom? Who says that you can't go to bed at night and not have a care in this world? Who says that you will always fight depression? I've got a question for you tonight and it's very simple. Who told you? you got to check your resources. you got to check the word of God. you got to check what the Lord is saying. His word is forever settled in heaven. So who told you? Whose report are you going to believe tonight? Clap your head and love him in this house. Who told you that you won't see miracle signs and wonders? Who told you that we can't have people getting baptized every single week? Who told you that we can't have people getting the Holy Ghost every weekend? Who told you that this church will never run 500 or 1,000 or whatever God wills? Who said God can't elevate this church to lead other churches? Who said FAC can't start daughter churches? churches uh, and evangelize uh, into the reaches uh, of Aurora uh, and Naperville, uh, Oswego, uh, Montgomery, uh, Batavia, uh, Wheaton, uh, Lyle, uh, Warrenville, uh, Sugar Grove, uh, Bolingbrook, uh, Yorkville, uh, Plainfield. Uh, Who told you? uh, I say don't take the bait. Uh, Don't take the bait. Uh, Someone needs to rebuke the devil. Uh, Someone needs to put him uh, in his proper place. Uh, Someone needs to shake the dust from off your feet and say, I believe, I believe the word of God tonight. Stand to your feet all across this place. Stand to your feet, raise your hands, raise your voices to the Lord. Who told you? Who told you? Who told you? Young people, who told you you can't change your high school? Who told you you can't be missionaries, preachers? Missionaries that do the work of God. I believe God can touch these young people. I believe they can, that God can use them to start P7 clubs that will go in and change high school campuses and junior high campuses and college campuses. I believe, I believe what God has said that in the last days, saith the Lord, he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh.
who told you you can't live holy and righteous in 2020? Who told you that just because you have a backbone that's based on the Word of God, uh, that you are judgmental uh, and you are old-fashioned. Uh, I say, who told you that lie? Because that's not what the Word of God says. Who told you? Who told you? Hey, Someone needs to begin just to prophesy over your own situation. Come on, would someone just begin to prophesy? This is what thus saith the Lord. Oh, there is such a current of the Holy Ghost that's in this place right now. Someone needs to begin to check their resources. Someone needs to begin to check uh, the information that you've been given because it's bad information. You've been sold a bill of goods, uh, and that bill of goods is nothing but a big old lie. Uh, I say to you tonight, uh, who told you? Uh, who told you? Uh, who told you tonight? Who told you that God can't heal cancer? Who told you that he can't take cancerous tumors off of an eye that you may receive the glory? I pray you would step out of your pew, make your way around this altar, and realize that the Word of God is forever settled in heaven. You can bank on it. You can live by it. You can make decisions based on the Word of God. Come on, someone needs to be delivered tonight from the lies of the enemy. He has waged war on the Word of God. Oh, someone needs to rebuke the devil. Rebuke the devil. And he will flee. He will flee from you. Come on, someone walk in the anointing. Someone walk in the power of the Holy Ghost right now. Who told you they'll never be healed? Who told you he can't restore a marriage? Who told you he can't put it back together? Saint of God. Hey, Ara Soto Koye Harayamaha. Hey, Arome Heke Shayaranataha. Who my Shia Kataya Nano Moto Hey Anara. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, he's breaking chains of the lies. He's breaking through. He's cutting the shackles off. He's releasing the prison doors of those lies that you've been told. Whose report are you going to believe? As for me and my house, we're going to believe the report of the Lord tonight. Thank you. 